Let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn over to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. I don't know if you've come across this text before in your own reading of Scripture. It really stands out in the book of Deuteronomy, really uh, in the whole Pentateuch as preparatory instruction regarding what they were to do uh, when they took on a king. And in the text, it goes into detail uh, regarding instruction regard, uh, about that matter. And it says in, um, if you look down at verse 14 of chapter 17, it says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee. And then it's going to give a list or a prescription of the requirements of that king. Now, this is, this is very important for the nation. Uh, it's, uh, it really is something that you see kings in the future. As you go in the uh, book of First, Second Kings, as in the Chronicles, as you look especially after the time or even in the life of uh, Solomon and onward, uh, how they transgressed the prescription and how it really ended up being a, a stumbling block for them. But if you look down through the different prescriptions and you have you know, the one that God would set over. It has to be somebody among their brethren, not somebody outside of Israel. Uh, verse 16, not somebody who would, uh, that king should not multiply horses and uh, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Uh, it goes on to say in verse 17, he should not multiply, wi multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Solomon certainly did that. He multiplied wives from other nations, uh, probably, mostly, I should say, in, the, in respect to alliances. And they did turn his heart away from God. Neither shall he mul uh, greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. But this is what I want to come to is verse 18. Okay, If you look at verse 18 down through verse 20, it's going to be really, I believe, the focal point of the success of any coming king. Let's read the text. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside uh, from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. We just commit it to you. We pray that you'd richly bless it. Help this to be an encouragement to us in our own walk with you and our own relationship with you through your word. And we thank you for what you'll do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, no doubt as we come uh, to a text like this, and as I consider the people that I'm speaking to, especially on a Wednesday night, uh, this, is, this is a text that really you would think we should already have the basic elements of the principles of this text ingrained in our souls. Uh, but what I really find in myself is that I can still have times of struggle, and, and the struggle can even be something, though the struggle may not win against me, that I can feel the pressure, and I, I find myself having to push back against it. The role of the Word of God in the lives of the kings, really, we can find a parallel to the role of the Word of God in our own lives. I realize what we're going to be looking at here is very basic in the sense that when you ever talk about the relationship of believers to the Word, and you're talking to mature believers, there's already a certain level to which there has been maturity, there has been 
establish patterns in the life. But I really believe that just like as I went through this just recently, there's this freshness to it. And it really brings me, it draws me back to certain principles that help to bolster up when there are these pressures that come against my relationship to the Word of God. I trust the Lord will use this uh, this way in this time. So we're going to be looking at this simply, the rhythm of the Word, two elements, its practice and its benefits. And so as we look at what we're looking at here in the text, this rhythm of the Word, we're going to look at different aspects of it within the text. And if you allow me, I'm going to take the principles given to a king in a, another time frame to another whole nation, and I want to extract that out for us this evening as principles for our lives. In fact, you see in the book of Revelation that Christ has made us kings. <laughs> he has made us kings and priests. And so I think that we can take this and really find a benefit for it. So let's, look, let's go ahead and look down at the text. First of all, it's practice. When we talk about the rhythm of the word, it's practice. The first is simply this, the possession of the word the possession of the word. You see in the text, he had to go out and get himself a copy. And then uh, right after that, you see this in verse 19, the latter part, his exposure to the word, subletter B, possession. He had to have a copy, exposure. And it says there, he shall read therein. And it's interesting, <laughs> if you think about the word read, what do you think about? Probably what, what I think about is I sit down and I read the word. This word is rarely translated read, very rarely. It's, it's more of the idea of, of proclaiming or declaring. It is reading out loud, especially whenever you deal with the Scripture. It has the idea of reading something out loud, and it could be in a public setting or in a small setting or just somebody themselves reading the Scriptures out loud. Not to make any point of that, Really what we're talking about is exposure. So possession and exposure. Jump down to subletter D. We're going to skip subletter R, and we're going to go down to D. And D is simply this, the effect. So you have the possession of the word. He has a copy of the word himself. He has exposure to it. And through that exposure, there is this effect. It says this, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words. And I think if we could just stop there for a minute, we could extract some principles out of this. In other words, if I was meeting with somebody that was a young Christian, I could say to him very simply, <clears throat> what you need is you need to get a copy of the Word. In fact, we have copies of the Scriptures right back in this room. They're sitting there on the shelf. They were purchased, and they're there with the intent of giving a copy to somebody that comes in this church that needs a copy of the Scripture. In other words, what we're, we are concerned about is their actual possession of the Word. I don't know if you've ever been struck by this. We are so rich and wealthy in this nation. But let me just bring us into Morocco for a moment and a time that I had there with a man by the name of Nazir. I've mentioned Nazir before. When I first met him, again, as I've said before, I think I was the third Christian he had ever met. He was in his early 20s at the time. We met at a cafe that was just uh, located inside the large train station upstairs, back in kind of a more private area because of what we were dealing with. We're in a Muslim nation and had a great opportunity to talk with him. And while we were there, I gave him a copy of the New Testament in Arabic. And this was precious to him. And shortly thereafter, I think within less than maybe two weeks, it was evident this man had such a love for the Word that I really needed to get him a full copy of the Scriptures. And so we met uh, up by his house. I think, if I remember correctly, we probably went to another cafe up near that area. I remember we had some fellowship there, and we were walking away, and I, I had a, a full copy of the Bible in Arabic, in a plastic wrap so nobody could see what it was. And we were walking down along the way. We didn't do it where we were meeting, just in kind of a more public area. And I just gave him a copy of the scriptures there. And he was excited to have that. That was his first copy to, uh, that he's ever had, ever touched, I believe, of the word of God. That night, I get a picture from him sent, he 
took it on his telephone. He sent me a copy. I, I have it now. I think I even still have it in my telephone. It's, it's his desk. There's a little lamp here and his chair, and the Bible's open, and he's just relating how precious this is to him to possess for himself a copy of the Scriptures. I mean, and he was just enthralled. He talked about how close he felt to God in having that, that here are the words of the living God for him, and he has it right there on his little table. In this Muslim nation, after he met a, the Christian now for the third time and after searching so long, a long period of time uh, for such an opportunity. So let's not take possession for granted, but even for us, we realize necessity, possession. Let them have a copy of the scriptures uh, in their language. And then this, this exposure that they would read, and ah, oh, Nazia just read. He read and read and read. This guy, this guy devoured the scriptures. Uh, his reading, he would spend reading throughout the day in the scriptures and whole big segments throughout the day. I mean, he just, he was just, the, the word of God was everything to him, and he gave himself to it. I forget the, the numbers at some point in time. I think I had how much he was reading at a time, but it was just a remarkable amount. He was exposing himself to the Word. And then you have this. So we need to get a copy of the Word. We need to read the Word. And then we need the effect of the Word. We need to take it and allow it to work in our lives. But here's the, here's the difficulty. If we stop at this level, we're missing one of the key ingredients in the text. It's not just that the king needed to possess it, to be exposed to it, thereby through that exposure to be affected by it. It wasn't just those three. There was something else in the text that was very essential. If you look back up at it, back in verse 19b, it is that he shall read there in this exposure, but here it is, all the days of his life. If you go back up to C, you can fill that in now with regularity regularity. Now this is key. When we talk about the rhythm of the word in our lives, we're not just talking about the fact that we possess it and that we can carry it everywhere we go. That is a rhythm, but that's not it. It's not just that we carry it, that we possess it, that we have it, it's dear unto us. It's not just that, it's also that we are exposed to it but another part of this rhythm must be that it has a regularity to it. The inconsistency of our exposure to the word can be one of the greatest pitfalls to our Christian lives. It really can. And we're going to close with an illustration I think will demonstrate that for us, but I want to go on. We see this idea of regularity in several different texts. Psalm 1-2 talks about that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, and, uh, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way. And then there's this, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. So, so it's going to be something that's going to be all through the day. So I would like to propose that the benefit, the effect is of the Word of God is directly related to this fullness of the rhythm of the Word. That not only by, by possession and exposure, but by regularity, this rhythm is in our lives. But that is essential. Let me ask you a question. What is or what are some of the discouragements to a regular rhythm of the word, its exposure, and effect in our lives? What are some of the discouragements to that, some of the things that impede that? What would you think? You can give some answers to that if you want. If not, I have some written down. Anybody got anything? What's that? 
Okay, work, telephone, and obligations. Good. Good. Work, phone, and obligations. Good. Anything else? Yeah, sickness. Sickness can be a huge one. You know, sometimes you think, okay, that person's sick. All they have time to do is sit there and, and pray. But, you know, the reality is it might be very a great struggle for them to really have quality time with the Lord. They might be able to pray. They might be in a lot of pain and just, just under medication and all the struggles of that. What else might be a discouragement or, or take away this regularity and the rhythm of the word? Anything else in your experience or things that you... Okay, yeah, material things, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we have examples of that, like in Matthew 13, it talks about the, you know, the, the cares of this world and, and the, the riches and the, just being enamored with those things, taking our eyes off the essential. I think I put down things similar to that, other priorities, distractions, things of that nature. Let me suggest that there's also, even within the text, if you extract out of these four first ones, out of the idea of the possession, uh, the exposure, the regularity, and the effect of the word in our lives, if you take one of those out, I believe it's an incredible discouragement to really the whole rhythm of the word in our lives. And it's this, the effect of the word. Let me explain myself. Somebody has a freshness, they now have the word, they're exposing themselves to the word, and they're even doing it initially. They're like, okay, I have a schedule, I'm going to check off the number of chapters every single day, or every single day I'm going to check it off my calendar that I was exposed to the word. And I, I mean, they might even be doing it. They might have one of those schedules, McShane's Bible reading plan. They're doing it morning and evening, even. One of the greatest discouragements to them might be that there isn't this corresponding effect in their lives. The, the, the lack of benefit in their spiritual lives is a discouragement to their souls, and in that discouragement, they start to fall away from their regularity. And pretty soon, you have a break in that rhythm. And so what I'd like to do is, I'd like to suggest that that is one of the issues that breaks this rhythm. So when we look at the text, it's kind of like the Joshua 1.8 text, that the meditation on the Word of God has a driving point, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein, you see? It's not just the function of the meditating on the word with that regularity, it's with a focused purpose. Might we desire the milk of the word, not just the desire for the milk of the word, but with a focused purpose that we might grow thereby. And I think that we could take that from other scriptures and I bring that back into this just with a pastoral encouragement. What I have found is that when either in myself or in someone else, when I am not experiencing that growth, it's far different from when I'm experiencing the growth. I come to that word with that freshness for a desire for more. When I'm not experiencing that growth, or even worse, when I am resisting the growth because of some area in my life that I'm holding on to that's not pleasing to the Lord, it starts, to, it starts to break away at my commitment to the other aspects in the practice that we've looked at. So I really think that this is essential. Let me suggest this. You have this on your, on your sheet. A key, a key is the approach to our exposure. The approach to our exposure. I already brought out in the text, this word read, it has a different idea to it. I'm going to go a little bit farther. And what I would like to suggest is this, in the blanks right under the word key, right next to key, you can put the approach to our exposure. And right underneath that, this is what I like to suggest. Active listening makes exposure effective. Active listening makes exposure effective. How many have ever heard of the concept of active listening? Has anybody ever heard of that before? Okay, this, this is really a key concept today. It's key 
not in the spiritual realm. It's key in the business realm. It's key in the realm of like coaching and consulting. It's key in if you were to be uh, reading books on uh, leadership of a company, it would be key in the area of uh, counseling or psychology. It's very key out in the world. I want to read you a world definition of what active listening is. Just listen to this. This is off of a website that's a non-Christian website. It's just a worldly definition. So it's this world's definition, what they look at it. When you talk about active listening, what are you talking about? Just listen to this. This is, this is good. Active listening requires you to listen attentively to a speaker, understand what they're saying, respond and reflect on what's being said, and retain the information for later. Let me say that again. Active listening requires you to listen attentively to the speaker, understand what they're saying, respond and reflect on what's being said, and retain the information for later. Now, why do I say that that is so important to making our exposure to the word? When I sit down with the word, why do I say that's so important to make that effective, to make that powerful, to make it impact my life? It's because of this. This is not just some book. We all know that. This is from our Heavenly Father. And when I sit down in the morning, He desires to minister to my soul through these words. This, this, these words are alive. And so the idea of listening has everything to do with what happens when I expose myself to the Word whether it's in my daily devotions or in a time preaching where I get underneath the preaching of the word, or maybe you like to listen to podcasts or sermons. I love to listen to sermons. I love to listen to sermons while I'm driving and things like that. I'm hearing the word of God. It, it has everything to do what's taking place when I'm exposed to the word. So this idea of active listening is exceptionally practical in any relationship, especially between a husband and a wife. In fact, the closer the relationship comes, the more important this idea of active listening. And they've nailed it on the head. They've nailed it. It's right on. It's not anything to say about this world. It's that we're creating the image of God. And somebody looked at the whole idea and the problem of listening and communication and the problem in relationships. They came up with a pretty solid definition. I think you could almost take those aspects in that definition and break it down and find these principles within Scripture. I don't like to do that. I don't like to backtread into Scripture, but there's no doubt, if you think about it, to listen, to listen attentively to the Word of God. Listen attentively to it. We already talked about distractions. <laughs> One of the greatest difficulties when I come to the Word, like we just said, are the distractions that I bring to the table. Have you, ever, have you ever been so consumed with some worry that, I mean, you are like halfway through your reading and you can't even nail down virtually one key idea in what you just read? You're halfway done through your reading. I'm like, I'm like wow, <laughs> I just read a whole chapter. My thoughts have been racing on this thing I'm concerned about. Racing. Active listening shuts that all out. It's attentive. It removes all those distractions, both physical and mental. It exalts the importance of the Word of God. Just like in a relationship, it exalts the importance of that other person. We need to exalt the importance. This is God's Word. And then for us as believers is to open each, our hearts to each Word. Look at this. They talk about understanding. So we need to be attentive to the Word. Their next principle is to understand what should be the whole thing that's happening while I'm coming to the Word to really, uh, with attentiveness, to listen to the Word. What am I looking for? I'm looking for understanding, right? That's absolute key. And I have scriptures for all these things, but we really don't have time to, to really go into this uh, this evening. But let me just bring up this one point. I, I, I bring it up out of Psalm 119. What is the key to us to understanding the Word of God? It's that the Spirit of God would give us understanding, right? Well, how is he to do that? I, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but just the necessity of prayer as we come to the Word. And if we come to the Word and we have no acknowledgement in our soul of the necessity of God opening our understanding to, to really give us a full understanding of what we're reading, that is almost pagan. It is almost pagan. Listen to this out of Psalm 119. Blessed art thou, O Lord, 
teach me thy statutes. That's not from somebody who didn't know the word of God. Right? In Psalm 119, at least nine times, the psalmist prays, teach me. Nine times. Teach me. And I don't know what you pray. I often pray through one of the Psalms as I come to the Word of God in the morning. And sometimes, three verses later, I pray it again. Because I'm tired, and I'm not focused, and I'm not attentive, and it's, <laughs> I'm not there, you know. Understanding the Word. And then to reflect on and respond to the Word of God. That's powerful. So I sit there, I understand it, then I'm reflecting on it. I'm meditating on it, and it's application to my soul, and I'm responding to it. I'm opening my soul to it. And then to retain the Word of God, that is absolutely essential. And I'm not trying to exalt this worldly definition and say this is, this is it, but I'm saying the, our problem, I could just say this, our problem in our marriages, our problems in our families, our problems in our relationships with other people, so often are, are because we are not active listeners. I mean, I have played the fool so many times listening to somebody that I'm supervising or I'm over and I've got everything figured out and I've jumped to my conclusion as they're trying to explain the situation. <laughs> I didn't hear anything they said. You got to hear the whole matter, don't we? And uh, certainly, most certainly, in respect to the Word of God, let us be active listeners. This is what makes exposure effective. So there will be this benefit. Well, what are the benefits? We want rhythm, a rhythm of the Word in our lives. We possess it. We want exposure to it by many multiple ways, most certainly uh, in the reading of the Word. Uh, we want this to be regular uh, in its occurrence and that, that, there would, that there would be this effect that the rhythm wouldn't just be the first three. The rhythm would always include the intent of the effect. That we would not be satisfied. I remember when, we, when I was um, up at Camp Joy and we were just praying through different, uh, different decisions, particularly about going to the mission field. And I just had read through the first chapters of Exodus. I got to the end of it and I was like, I, d I didn't get anything out of that. And I just, I went back really looking for the Lord really applying this idea of active listening and looking for the Lord to minister to my heart. When I did, I started taking my pen, I started underlining the excuses that Moses gave to the Lord that he couldn't be the one that would go and be used by God in, in Israel or in, in Egypt to deliver Israel. It was the thing that, that brought me to a decision point, now is the time to go to the mission field. And it all started that morning with, with virtually not getting anything out of the Word. But going back, it was such a richness, and it brought me to one of the key decisions in my whole life. So we, we must not be satisfied with just the first three, with possession, exposure, and with regularity. We must have part of our rhythm, this, its effect upon us. And then let's just look at this real quickly, its benefits. Three things, its benefits. One is obviously a right relationship to the Lord. This is its effect, that they may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. This is The word of God is powerful. It changes us. It, uh, the spirit of God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And part of that is through the exposure to the word of God. This idea of the fear of the Lord is the outstanding Old Testament term for a right relationship to Jehovah God. And obviously the outflow of that is obedience to the word. The second point here is a right relationship to others. I love this, a right relationship to others, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. I thought about this. Isn't this true that so often when we are in conflict with others, right? when we are in conflict with others, that there is some fault on our part? We are sinners. We're saved by grace. We're delivered from the power of sin. We're delivered from its... It's guilt and it's condemnation, but it's still with us and will always be with us. Have you ever noticed in your own soul when, when there is a lack of a true 
rhythm like what we've just looked at with these four elements. When there's four elements and the rhythm of our time in the Word are not in our lives, that it just, we're more irritable. We're more sharp with people. Easier to be frustrated with people. I mean, it's just... It's just natural. The flesh, the sinfulness starts to just rise in our souls. But when we have this kind of rhythm with all four of these elements, there is a subduing of that in us. And it does. It has this ability to bring us in right relationship to others. Here it is stated as simply as a humility towards others. But I'm going to take it principially as that there is a right relationship with other people. I think it's wonderful. And then lastly is a consistency in your walk. A consistency in your walk. Verse 20b, and that he turned not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. A lot of failure in our consistency is because the rhythm that we have, the rhythm of the word in our lives that we are experiencing is not, that's not including all four of those elements. So the consistency in our walk, we, we tend, to take, tend to take steps off the path to the left or off the path to the right. And as we really have this kind of rhythm of the word in our lives, we will have a more solid footing. Now, in conclusion, why is this kind of rhythm so important? Well, and here's the last point at the very bottom. And here are the three words, building a sand castle, building a sand castle. One of the things, even to this day, that I love doing with my girls, if we go to the beach, is to get close, right on, there's, there's just the right place you want to be where the water's going to be, you know, coming against your sand castle. It's kind of where the sand is hard, but it still is being, the waves are still coming up sometimes. That's the ideal place to build a sandcastle. And you ever before, I've done this. I mean, we just get in there, we start building that thing, and pretty soon you're building it, and the waves are coming, and you're preparing in between. You, know, you have lower waves, and all of a sudden there's a higher wave. And you're preparing in between for the next wave that comes up. And what's happening? If you don't keep working, I mean, you've got to work, getting that sand on top of the, those walls, Right? And the problem is, as you dig out from in here, what do you find? I mean, the ocean's over there. We're building up the the walls right here. What's on this side as I start to dig that sand out to build the walls? It starts to fill up with what? With water. So now I have from the outside these waves coming, and from the inside, the water deteriorating the walls. And so you just got to keep working at it and working at it and, you know, Here's, here's one of my daughters here, and here's another one here, and we're all just kind of working on this thing, and I kind of just plop in the center, and just I'm working on it, and they're working on it. Rhythm. That sandcastle, okay, think of it this way. In us, that sin nature that still exists is like that water inside and it just keeps deteriorating at the, at the wall that you're building. And it's going to be there all of our days. There are things you can do. If you, if you make a moat around this side of the wall, you make it deep enough, you can drain out some of that water. Okay, it just takes, it takes some work. You can do it. But it's still going to be there. And there's going to be these waves coming from the outside. And if we don't have a rhythm of working and working and working it. If we're just counting on it, you know, every few days or every Sunday, we have this kind of four-part, you know, relationship or rhythm with the Word. We don't have it consistently in our lives. What we're going to find is every Sunday, those, you can tell where the sandcastle was if you leave and come back later. You can kind of see the big divot, and it's all filled in with water, and you can kind of see this rim. You wait too long, you come back, you can't see it. You can't even see the progress that was made at one point in time. What I'm trying to make is the illusion between that and our spiritual lives is that there needs to be this consistency in the grace of a rhythm of the word in our lives. Not only that we possess it, not only that we have exposure, but that exposure really be with active listening, that it has this regularity to it, 
with this intent of an effect. These benefits are seen in our lives. And, the, and there's going to be things that have come against it, waves from outside, water from within. But it's by the rhythm of it that those walls stay standing. And so I just want to encourage us in that respect. And I realize this is more devotional in nature, and I realize that you know, we're taking this text about this king and we're pulling it out and applying it to us today, but I think there's real application here. I felt it. I've experienced it myself. I've seen it in other people. I believe it's solid that we need to have this kind of rhythm of the word in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace. We just pray that you